Well, good morning and welcome to our life group lesson. Today is Sunday, October the 11th, and we are still in the, uh, the unit titled After God's Own Heart. This is actually our last lesson in this unit, and so we'll be covering the last three of the Ten Commandments. And today's title is Honor All Relationships. I want us to, before we break into this study, I want us to um, just have a little bit of a discussion about the difference between teaching strict theology and practical application. Um, a lot of people say, well, when I hear a sermon or a Bible study, I want practical application. So what does that actually mean? Well, if you remember, we've studied in these uh, life group lessons quite a lot of Paul's teaching and Paul's teaching was very much practical application. He was speaking to people where they were in their walk through life and helping them figure out how that applied, uh, excuse me, helping them figure out how the scripture applied to their life. Let me say that that way. And so one of the things that you noticed that we pointed out was that Paul would usually attack the action sins first. He would go very directly at, here's what you're doing wrong. You're lying, you're stealing, you're cheating, you're doing these things wrong. You have to stop doing those things. And then he would begin to peel back the layers of the onion, and he would go a little deeper, and he would begin to get into the motives and the attitudes. I call those the, the sins of motive, uh, the, the reason why. What's wrong with me that makes me want to lie, cheat, or steal? And so I want you to think about those things, and we're going to touch on that in just a moment. But I want us to go to Exodus chapter 20, because Exodus chapter 20 is not really practical application. It's just pure theology. It is just teaching us this is the truth about God, and this is what God expects of us. Now, the practical application comes later, but I want us to understand the instruction that you read in Exodus chapter 20 is backwards from what Paul does because God isn't starting with the action sins. He's starting with your attitude and your motives. He's beginning with the foundation, and that is he himself. And so when you look at the, uh, the very first four commandments, um, and let's go... Let's go and, and, and go back and look at those a little bit. Those first four commandments, and I'm paraphrasing here, no other gods. I'm the only God. You can have no other gods. Number two, no idols. You don't worship anything besides me. Don't even abuse my name. Don't even take my name for granted. And fourth, honor the Sabbath, which is simply don't forget God. So the very first four commandments, or I would say 40% of this Decalogue deals with God and my relationship with him and how I treat him and what I believe about him. So I must have my theology correct in understanding the sovereignty of God and how important he is and how unique he is and that I can't have anybody besides him and I can't have any idols and I cannot abuse his name and I cannot forget about him. So that's pretty significant that 40% of the Ten Commandments is dealing with getting that right. And then, of course, the fifth commandment is to honor your parents. Now, why, you may ask, why do my parents get special treatment over other people in my life? Well, first of all, regardless of how you feel about your parents, and I'm going to be real honest with you, a lot of people have problems with their parents. A lot of people uh, were raised by parents who were not perfect. Uh, wait a minute. All of us were raised by parents who were not perfect. And so we all have some sense of dysfunction in our lives. It just depends on how much it is and how well we roll with it. But I want you to keep in mind, why do you parents get uh, special attention from God? Why does God put them right there behind him honor your parents. Well, your parents, like it or not, are the vehicle that God used to bring you into this world. 
And I always say to people, if you think you're a pretty good person, and uh, you have to keep in mind that if your parents brought you into this world, they're not all bad. So cut them some slack. And I realize there are a lot of people who are raised in abusive households and, and deal with a lot of horrible, terrible things. And I, I understand that. But I want you to realize that your parents represent your beginning. Your parents represent the, the very conception of you which was ordained by God and represent the beginning of you and the formation and the foundation of you. And regardless of whether you were raised by the most incredible parents or the worst parents, you need God no matter what. Now, if your parents were not very good, you need God even more. You really, really need to let God work on you. So if that's your case, how do I honor my parents? Well, you may have to honor your parents with forgiveness. That may be the thing that you have to do to honor your parents is to be willing to forgive them uh, of the things that they did wrong and the way that they treated you. And so I just want you to understand you have to honor your parents with love, respect, perhaps forgiveness. And so now we've got half, half of the Ten Commandments. We're halfway through the Ten Commandments and we've only dealt with three people, God and your parents. So I, I kind of put this out here, and yes, it's crude, forgive me, but if you look at it as a pyramid, God is absolutely at the top. Your parents, very next one, that's half of it. That's half of everything you need to deal with is God and your mom and your dad. And then you can get to everybody else. And so what are the other things? Um, When you get to everybody else, then you're looking at commandments 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. But I just want you to understand, you're not going to do very well with these unless you've done well with these. You've got to be theologically sound in your relationship with God, and then you've got to deal with your relationship with your parents, and then you can move forward to other people. I mean, you think about it this way, I realize that um, I've been married for 32 years. My wife, obviously, is more significant in my life than my parents are at this stage. Uh, but I had my parents first. The way that I dealt with my parents has a whole lot to do with how I learned to deal with my wife and my own children. And so that's why I say it's absolutely critical that you spend some time on your knees making sure that you have... Uh, the correct theological understanding of who God is and how he used your parents to bring you into this world and how he wants you to deal with that. And then you can move on. Now, when you look at Paul's teaching, Paul's teaching was kind of upside down. Obviously, Paul is trying to get people to figure out who God is, but... I want you to realize that Paul is a, a missionary and a pastor. And Paul is going out around the world that he knows, and he is spreading the gospel, and planting churches, and trying to teach new Christians Christianity. He's trying to teach them theology. So why did he teach it backwards or upside down? I want you to realize that Paul was already dealing with people who did not know God. Paul was dealing very often with people who had been raised in pagan, uh, pagan cultures where uh, anything and everything might be worshipped or nothing might be worshipped. And these are people who didn't really know God. They did not have a basis or an understanding. They did not have a good foundation theologically. And so Paul was often dealing with people, even new Christians within the church, who were struggling with this part, and it was the part that was overwhelming their lives. In fact, he was dealing with people, and you read this in his letters, some of the, the church members had committed murder, and some of them had committed adultery, and some of them were thieves, and some of them were liars. In fact, I wanted to remind you of uh, something we studied in here a few weeks ago from Ephesians chapter 4, in Ephesians chapter 4, 
verses 25 through 28. I want to read that to you because I want to remember I want us to remember some of the things that Paul was speaking and teaching to his church and what he was dealing with and he says to the church there in Ephesus, therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor, for we are all members of one body. So Paul is telling them, you've got to stop lying and you've got to start treating your neighbors properly. In other words, he's saying, this is all messed up. You're, you're not dealing with these things properly. Now, Paul is understanding that at their stage in life, those things are sort of top-heavy. Those are the action sins that he's wanting them to deal with. Clear these things out of your life. So he's having to actually teach them the practical application and help get them down to the deep theology. And uh, he goes on to say this, do not let the sun go down while you are still angry and do not give the devil a foothold. He who has been stealing must, he's talking to the church, okay? He who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with his own hands that he may have something to share with those in need. Paul is dealing with people who do not have the proper theological foundation. They are struggling. These are people who have come to know Christ Jesus. They have been saved, but they're having to learn theology. They're having to be taught. You see, this is why church is so important. I was raised in church, and I was taught theology from the beginning. Now, I'm an analytical person, I don't believe things just because somebody tells me from the pulpit. I believe it when I go and study it myself and I pray about it and the Holy Spirit convicts me and lets me know, yes, this is truth, okay? Um, and it's very important that we continue the tradition of the church that we teach people we teach our children proper theology. If we can start them here, they have a much better chance of getting here properly. But if you will agree with me on this, you will agree that as the church has eroded within our culture in this country, and people don't attend church, they don't go to Sunday school, in fact, a lot of churches place very little emphasis on study school or life groups or whatever you choose to call it. They place very little emphasis on personal Bible study and small group Bible study. And so we're not teaching children in America the very basics and the theology and the foundation of who God is. And so when they get to here, they're not that great at dealing with other people. And that's what you saw here, that's what Paul was often dealing with, and that is what we're dealing with now in the 21st century when we get people uh, to come and, and they're open to Christ, very often their lives at this stage are a mess. And God can clean up messes, but I'm helping you to understand where we have to, uh, how we have to uh, teach people. Where are we in our culture? How do we begin this process of evangelizing people? And so I want us to go back to the Decalogue. I want us to go back now to the Ten Commandments. And as I said, we've already looked at the first five. And then, of course, we've covered in the last couple of weeks the sixth and the seventh, which are you shall not murder, and you cannot commit adultery. And we talked last week about honoring marriage. And so the last three are you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony against your neighbor, and you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his manservant or maidservant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. I want us to unpack that for a moment. 
6 and 7, don't kill and don't commit adultery. Uh, commandments 8, 9, and 10, don't steal, don't lie, don't covet. I want you to consider the progression of these Ten Commandments. Sin is sin. We all know that. We understand theologically that one sin is not worse than another. There are not certain sins that will send you to hell and other sins, eh, they're not so bad. That's not the way it works. The scripture says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And that means all of us need Jesus to save us from sin in general. But we do understand from a practical standpoint that different sins have a different uh, set of consequences. And so when you think of the 10th commandment, don't covet. Basically, don't be jealous of what other people have. We would quantify that as probably the least of these. In other words, we would say, well, if I covet my neighbor's property, that's a sin according to the 10th commandment. But if I went and lied about how my neighbor got his property, that's probably worse than just me in my mind being jealous of what he has. And if I actually went and stole his property, we would consider that to be worse and that would have greater consequences. And if I were caught, I would go to jail. Now, if I actually killed him so that I could take his property, we would consider murder to be far greater than coveting. So again, I don't want to classify sins as these are good ones and these are bad ones because sin is sin and all sin separates us from God. But I want you to consider that when you look at the Ten Commandments, there is a natural progression of the greater to the lesser. The absolute worst thing that you can do in your life is to dismiss God. That is the worst possible thing that you can do. Um, if you dismiss God, guess what? You're probably going to turn into a liar, a cheater, a thief, maybe a murderer. You're probably going to become those things if you have no use for God. These are serious, serious things. And so, when you look back at what we've studied with Paul, Paul was dealing with people who had made a mess out of their lives. And he's trying to help them understand, if you can begin to strip these things away, then you can get back to who God is, and you can honor God and love God and put God first in your life. And so when you look at the practical application, what are the practical application of the Ten Commandments? Well, let's put it this way. What if we could somehow convince the entire world to follow these Ten Commandments? What if we could somehow convince the entire world to determine that God Almighty, the God of the Bible, Jehovah God, the God of Israel, the God of the church, is the only God? Recognize that and put him first. And then what if we could convince the entire world to not worship anything else and to not forget God but to honor him through the Sabbath? And then what if we could convince the whole world to honor their parents, just show love and respect for their parents, forgive them if necessary? And then what if we could convince the entire world, don't kill anybody, uh, don't commit adultery, don't steal anything that's not yours, and don't lie about people, and don't be jealous. If we could convince the whole world to do that, let's just suppose we could somehow do an experiment where the whole world did that for one year. Everybody on the planet, seven billion of us all agreed, for one year, we're going to do this. Do you realize what a different world we would live in? Do you realize what an incredibly peaceful place the earth would be? Do you realize there wouldn't be any war? There wouldn't be any murder. 
There wouldn't be any violent crime. There wouldn't be any stealing. It, there would be nothing for the nightly news to even discuss because there would be nothing negative for them to grab hold of. Do you realize the practical application if people would simply take God's Ten Commandments and say, we're going to live by that. So why is it so difficult for us as humans to grab hold of those ten simple things and, and follow them? It is difficult because the enemy is telling us, God doesn't love you. God doesn't care about you. You're not good enough. Your parents were bad. You shouldn't expect much out of yourself. And other people, well, they're mean and they're ugly and they're all out to get you and this and this and this and this and all this negativity that Satan is constantly pouring into us. He's attacking us by attacking God, by attacking all the people around us and trying to let us think that it's simply not worth it. So I want us to go very back uh, to the beginning. Chapter 20 of Exodus. And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God. That's personal. God is saying, I am your God. He is the God. He is the only God. But he's getting really personal. He's saying, I'm your God. And he says this specifically who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Now, did he bring us, the church, out of Egypt? No. What he is telling us is, what did he bring me out of? Brought me out of sin, death, and hell. Whew. Gave me Jesus Christ to deliver me. Whew. Gave me life to be here. Now, the fact that I'm here means I've got to do something with it. How do I get after God's own heart? I can't find anything in the scripture that's going to help me any more right now than the words that God spoke. I am the Lord, your God. That is very, very personal. God is a very personal God. He loves me in spite of me. He loves you in spite of you. He loves even those who don't love him. He loves even those who mock him. He loves those who do bad things. He is calling them to repentance. The scripture says that he doesn't want anyone to perish, but for all to come to repentance, for all to find salvation. He loved us enough to send Jesus Christ to this earth, to the cross, to the tomb, but to be resurrected for our salvation. He loved us enough to establish this church to establish his scripture, to inspire men to write this down, to put it together so that he could speak directly to us so that we could have this right here in our hands. He loved us enough to send his Holy Spirit, the Comforter, to come and not only indwell me as a temple, but to indwell the church, the body of Christ. He loved us enough to put this body of people together to support us, to encourage us, to pray for each other. When you think about all of these things that God has done for me, and really all he asked me to do is 10 simple things. It's really not a burden, but do you see the freedom that comes in following these commandments? And when you see the freedom that comes in that and the joy that can arise from that, then you begin to see that God's own heart is that he loves you, he delights in you, he wants you to have joy, he wants you to have peace, he wants you to have freedom, he wants you to feel loved. So I want us to pray about that. Our great Father, we thank you so much for these beautiful, beautiful Ten Commandments, Lord. We thank you for the theology that is behind them, and we thank you, Father, that you love us enough to save us, that you love us enough to give us direction in our lives. And, Father, we thank you for that. We pray that you would cover us and guide us and help us. 
In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now don't forget that October the 25th at 9 o'clock, we will have live life group again. We'll have a group for our adults in the fellowship hall. We'll have a, a group for our youth in Heron Hall. And we'll have a group for our children up on the second floor in the children's room. They have a huge room up there. And we will also continue to do this um, through media uh, for those who are simply not able to attend. And so I pray that you would uh, just follow the Lord's leading and however you can get involved in that. But please, please understand the importance of us coming together, whether it's virtually or live, but for us as a church coming together to study the Word of God together in a small group to build one another up. Thank you for your support. Thank you for your love and look forward to seeing you next Sunday.